taking responsibility for their job. They gave birth to a child, they're a parent, and they don't seem to participate in the responsibility that comes to the title parent. And that's what I think we should start to figure out are ways to uh, help parents be the parent they're supposed to be. Uh, we, we create programs for all the children, but we can't get the children in those programs unless we get the parents to wake up and realize this is an advantage here. Take advantage of it. So, you know, I'm asking anyone here if you you, you know have any ideas that could help us reach the parents that need to be reached. Uh, Paul David, would you like to um, I'd actually, I guess, prefer the question to Mr. Shinovsky, who is on the committee, uh, the Communications and Community Relations Committee of the school board. Um, some of the things we're looking on, looking at is a community newsletter, um, a key community, key communicators network. And I guess, Mr. Shinovsky, if you have any comments about that, um, as far as reaching out to the parents who haven't already been, you know, don't already know what's going on in the school district. Do you like to say anything about that as far as how we're trying to reach out? Well, I think Paul raised some good points, and I think, you know, Mary Ellen's comment about how to reach parents who are not being reached, um, and part of that is some of the community programs and, and connections between schools and community programs, um, and some good things that are happening in our community are programs like FAST, uh, Families and Schools Together. Pearl and I were just talking about a recent graduation that is engaging parents at the school building where their children go. Um, our Norristown Family Center uh, involves parents and with activities with their children in the preschool years. Um, and the more connections we can make, the different the scouting programs, the, the more connections we can keep making with more people, it seems that we're bringing more people into you know, attending functions like this and, and other programs. Through the uh, Communities That Care program, you can address there's another program that's going to be active in our community, engaging parents and children together in um, <coughs> some school readiness activities. But the problem still exists, getting the parents out. Northtown has been blessed through the Weed and Seed Revitalization Program and Communities That Care to have three parenting teaching tool programs coming into the Northtown community. We have been granted for the next four years to provide teaching to parents from pre-K to third is the first program which is called Parenting for School Success. The next one is called Guiding Good Choices. It, it focuses on parents of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. These are preventive programs. We have life skills teaching for the older ones. We as Northtown School Board, parent boards, community members, we really need to get together in meetings like this and not just talk about the problems, but actually work on brainstorming. How can we get parents out? We know through our programs, if you feed them, it's one thing, the time, the um, activities, prizes. We do tumble saws in these little local programs to get um, parents out. But maybe if we work together in mass with the media, with, with our newspapers, with our radios, and really let parents know that parents, you are the key to your child's success. Then we as teachers, educators, and community leaders don't have to come in here time after time and hang out amongst ourselves. <laughs> Committee for the school district. Uh, my thoughts are going to expose the parents. And I'm not making excuses for parents, but a lot we have working parents and they're not available to get to meetings during the evening. Uh, a program like this, if it's shown on our school channel and the students are aware of it, to tell their parents so that they can see this, and I'm sure they'll walk away saying, safety, we do have safety in our school district, and there's other things that they might be exposed to other than uh, what they're hearing in the street. So I think if this program is shown on our school channel, it'll be to our advantage. In fact, uh, it'll probably be shown three times, four times in the yeah. next, uh, I forget how long it normally takes. Basically, you know about it. Uh, the are not sure quite sure where it will be on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this week. It might this be, week, or it would be actually this It could week. possibly, but they don't have school on uh, Monday, and that's right. when the scheduling takes place. So it may be a week away. Okay. So, but it will be on TV. That's it. No. But no. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, is it possible to work through the churches on an ongoing basis? have someone get in 
those churches every Sunday and talk to uh, have the ministers to the ministerium. We have the ministerium in our staff. Have the ministerians alert to the fact that there will be someone in their churches on an ongoing basis, perhaps once a month, to talk to the people because most of your people are church going people, most of your parents. I know the whole concept of incorporating the churches of the community into just about every aspect of our community that has any negative overflow has always been coming up. Um, I mean, the key is to, I guess, get who is going to be going yeah. to these churches. Yes. I mean, we have quite a few. A representative from each of these churches, I'm sure, you know, and, and that goes for all of Norristown. Yeah. You know, it's definitely uh, an idea that needs further research. Okay. Um, as we know, too, we're speaking about the and so we have a large percentage of our young adults, our young teenagers, who are saying babies are having babies. And that is a really a big, big problem in that age. Where babies are having babies, they don't have time to be mothers, or they don't have time even to grow themselves. So that is a big problem. So the clergy, that would be a good impact for them to get involved because the community, when the, you know, when the church is out of order, then the whole community is out of order. So I think the clergy, uh, they should, you know, play a very big role. Now, how are we going to get them? Well, I mean, this is our kind of, you know, statement of what we should do, but they should start taking more interest too in the community. Because when I was going to school, like in uh, uh, San Francisco, I was at Washington School as a little girl growing up. I, I know what he did, because I was there. And I know what he did when he came into school. So I can vouch for everything he said. And as for a parent, oh, I know the bottom line for a parent, what they did, because I was a child, too. So, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that, that is a big problem, though. We have these young teenagers that, you know, pregnancy rates are really, really high. Thank you. I, I, I just want to say a couple, two little short things that I want to get. Safety patrols, I don't know if they still have them in the school now, but uh, they don't have safety. But I, I thought that was a great thing. Uh, in fact, Captain Michette was a safety at Washington School. Chief Bono was a safety at Holy Day. Dr. Puello was my I'll son was a safety head. at first. You know, they tell me that they were safety patrol. But you know, we look at Norristown and you know, everybody gets all upset about it. But always remember an old little phrase, all sunshine makes deserts. So if you want a beautiful garden, you're gonna have to have all kinds of little problems and we can handle these problems, you know. And then you, you brought up about the church. If I had a youth referral where we had a kid would be involved, I would we, I would each church had a representative. And we'd say, look, this kid just you know, put him on me, you know, just what I don't want to send to court, say. But uh, one other thing, when I first started as a juvenile officer, if a kid was, uh, that was true in so many days, they accumulated so many days, they could refer him to juvenile court. They stopped it. Now he has to commit a, a crime that an adult would commit. So they thought juvenile the delinquency wasn't a, a, a you know, serious thing for the courts, but it, but it is. You know. And there's no phrase, a child who has been taught to respect the laws of God will have little trouble respecting the laws of man. And that's basically really, I don't care what, what religion you are. I have a, a son that's a missionary priest in Peru. So, and then he, up 10,000 feet up in the Andy Mountain. Let me tell you, they got problems, <laughs> real problems. So we should be happy what we got. We got educated people, educated kids, and, and it's a great town. And we are the county seat, wherever I go, I say I'm Norristown, the largest bird in the world. Give a shot over there, okay? Yeah, I just like to say um, that the impression that I'm getting from some of the, the panelists is that um, this meeting today is as a result of maybe two or three incidents that have happened just this year. Um, but me being a parent, I've experienced it firsthand. I have a child that's in the high school. She's um, very intelligent, she's in the gifted program, she's an athlete, she's beautiful, um, and she was picked on all throughout middle school to the point that at the end of eighth grade, she did not want to go to the high school. She cried every day. She was picked on every day to the point that she was, I had registered her for Kenrick and she was going only for the fact that a teacher who was currently teaching at Eisenhower 
came and talked to me and said, give us a chance, you know, with the, you know, she'll get you know, on the team at the high school and, and maybe she'll adapt some friends there. And, you know, as a result of that, she has had so far an okay experience. But I'm telling you that this is real. This is something that our children are dealing with. I have another child who, in elementary school, he, he had to deal with a child who had a lot of behavior issues all through, I think it went over a course of a year that this child kicked him, spit on him, hit him, the same child. And then when he retaliated, finally felt he had to defend himself, he was told that he would be suspended because we have a zero tolerance policy. So it's not working for everyone. And and I, I, I think that this is something that should be looked at. If I could just, yeah. just speak to that. Um, and. If you look at any of the literature coming out of studies with children these days, and it seems a lot of it to be girls, the bullying aspect, the, the, this, this, what, what, they're the meanest possible to each other than anybody could have that with. And this is where a lot, we're focusing an awful lot of our interventions on. We are looking at a bullying prevention program. Uh, at the high school, we found somebody, we thought it would work, and we recently found it's really geared towards middle school. We're looking for a, a high school version of it. But that, uh, in my opinion, of all of the kinds of violence and annoyances and things that happen, bullying used to be called harassment, whatever you want to call it, that I think is the biggest problem among children right now. And can I say, I think it just all stems to maybe having some sort of self-esteem classes. I think that our girls, you know, especially as you said, they don't realize that there's a whole big world out there. There are lots of things that they can go on and do with their life. They just kind of see Norristown as this is it. This is all that exists. And if maybe they were exposed to some of the things that they could become, we are certainly working and made believe that you know that, that they will be able to go on and do some of these things. Maybe they high expectations. High expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Big world out there. Yeah. Yeah. We need to bring the graduate to those who have graduated and have successfully gone on to secure their positions in life. You need to bring those children back, those young people back. Absolutely. To talk to these children and let them see what can happen. Many of our kids don't even know there's a world of work out there. We're sending all of our seniors out on April 1st to a job site for the day. And let them know that on a job site, you have to dress professionally. You can't use obscene or vulgar language. You have to listen to your boss. And, and that's the kind of thing we're, we're working. A lot of them don't even realize like, that they're grades. That's things that employers look at to have an opportunity to come in at a higher level, depending upon your grades. I mean, these are things they don't know. Dress code is very important, and that's something that you worked on when I was in the system, but the parents refused it. Now, you've got problems with just that one issue. And you brought up a very good point. It's obviously not just Northstown's problem, but it's a countrywide problem. <laughs> 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 that's what I'm right. We're all saying that. Let me the last yeah. question. Well, I see you back there. Yeah, I know you saw me there. Go ahead, <laughs> Question and comment is uh, related to what she's saying. I know physically the children are safe in school. That uh, for the most part goes without question. But like she said, for a very long time, do the children feel secure in school? There's a difference between feeling physically safe and feeling secure enough to voice your opinion if it differs from the general, what's generally popular to say inside the school. Now, I see focus placed on top-end students and focus placed on, um, for lack of a better word, bottom-end students, but what about all the students in between who may see a program, think it's okay, but they won't join that program because technically it's not popular enough to join it. They don't feel <coughs> secure enough in the school to go outside of what the general thinking or popular concept what's being done to address that. I mean, I understand that there are parents who are not engaged, but for the school experience itself, the children are experiencing that. And you can have the games with the parents and the children, but for the most part, this is something that um, is helping their children go uh, to adulthood. The parent can't be there 
to help the child reach adult. It's things they have to go through themselves, but they have to feel secure about doing that. And it's great. I mean, yes, the schools are safe, but what's being done so that the children feel secure? I just want to say on a high school level, a lot of the discourse in classrooms has to do with the free exchange of ideas and different opinions and those kinds of subjects. And a student has to be comfortable enough to be able to say what might be an unpopular opinion or, or whatever. And the teachers work on that on a regular basis. And it is an uphill battle. I won't pretend it isn't. And it should happen, and we work on it, but I, I think the one thing we've got today is, this is a lot, I like your little hand symbol. It's a whole lot of efforts that need to be coordinated. We have a wonderful parents club at the high school, which is very unusual for a high school. High schools traditionally have, you know, two people in a parents club. We have 40 to 60 people in our parents club, and they are fabulous, but we have 17, 99 students, where are the rest of those parents? And, and that's what we try for, because they're part of the, the interchange too. Bill? Uh, a couple of things, um, to go off uh, some of the statements that we made, I think one of the things that I picked up from what Hank was saying, uh, I work in an alternative school, uh, so we, and I know Dr. Jaffe has as well, uh, and we think, kids who are, are often very troubled and some of the things that we have found that are effective is number one relationship, number two relationship, and the third big thing is relationship. Uh, rewards and punishments often aren't effective as if as much as if you know something about this kid and can relate to them. And it goes even further with the parents. I think a lot of times we as teachers do not communicate with the parents until there is a problem. So if you've got 20, 25 kids in your elementary class or whatever your student load is, I think it's incumbent upon the professional staff in the high school or the middle school, or especially the elementary school, where we're all pointing out that the preventive work has to be done at the elementary level, to get on the phone to parents and talk about something, text the kid being good. Uh, and if you get that parent hook, or you get that kid hook in a relationship, somehow trying to understand what he or she is going through. Uh, next time you call that parent and say, hey, remember I said he was doing well. Well, today we have this going. And it's a lot different than if that's the first time you ever talk to that parent when you have a good problem. We started a bully prevention program at our school. It comes out of, uh, I think, Sweden, Aldeas. Um, and the intermediate unit uh, has trainers to do that work as well. And the whole, and bullying has gone way down in our school because the major emphasis on the program is it's, we're, it's important to us. It's important to the staff. We have posters, we have expectations for kids. Don't, if you see somebody being victimized, don't stand by. You know, don't let somebody be bullied. And we have a class a couple times a week where we talk about this kind of thing, about getting involved positively. It was interesting to me earlier in the week when we found out that on um, one of our buses on the way home, that a kid pulled a knife on another kid. And it came out through the school district in the eastern part of the county, because we take kids from all over the county. And we got the word, and by the time we got the word in school as staff, Kids already knew that kid had a knife in the school the previous day. But nobody said anything. And I think some of the students up here have alluded to that as well, is it's up to us to develop a culture in which students who know what's going on or what's coming down, if you will, can feel safe enough and secure enough to go to adults and say, I need to talk to somebody because something's going to happen and can be prevented um, before tragedy. I just wanted to share that with you. Doris? It all spins down really to parenting and from the time. If the parents are not doing their job like we live in, like all of us are saying, it's, it's different.
difficult for to, to if the child from infant to five, if they haven't gotten something from infant to five, and then go out and then get into the school, it's hard for you, me, or anybody else to train a child. The, the Word of God says we have to train up the child in the way he should go. So it all stems down to what God says to do. And if we do what the Lord says do as parents, when we get that time to be parents, then we get the same. I don't know how many of you are aware of it or not. Um, our Norristown Education Association, which is our teachers, are, um, they get a lot of negative publicity too, um, whether it be for health benefits or whatever other things, salaries that they may command. They give books to all newborns in the hospitals. Um, this is money that they donate to, the, to their group uh, to do that. The parent is the first teacher. And the parents have to know that. And they are their first and only teacher for quite a long time. So that the fact that our teachers are doing this, should they should be commended for that. Um, and I don't think that they do get the recognition on that one. They also give uh, grants to organizations that are dealing with our kids uh, on the outside. Uh, there was an article in the paper on that one this week too, if, 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 you, um, if you happen to have seen it. These are things I happen to know, but it's stuff going on that is kind of quiet. But people, you know, they're, as Karen said, people are working in a thousand different organizations, but we do need some coordination. But how we get those parents, I can remember when I was president of Birdside back in the 1970s, we tried to get people from, uh, this was just when um, kids started being bussed all over the place, and we tried to get other people. We offered to go down to go to um, their homes and pick them up. We sent buses out. Um, we had coffee clutches in, in homes. We did all of this. You might get one person, you might get two. Um, I don't know the answer to this question on how to get the parents. I've served on a parent involvement committee for the state. Um, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, there are a lot of different answers, a lot of different ways. And one of them is getting the kids involved in activities in school. If a kid's in a play, the parent comes. If the kid sings, the parent comes. If the kid's in the sport, the parent comes. We're hoping Junior RTC will do this too. We're hoping that a lot of different programs will do this. But it's incumbent upon the parents and the staff to encourage kids to get involved in extracurricular activities. To me, this is one of the most important things going. Um, I think that the last
programming and getting them involved. And I really, not that we to say it all the time, I'm for mandating it as far as part of the punishment that we have to mandate them to participate in or build it into the system in some type of way. Private schools, private schools make their kids participate in some programs within the school. And the parents. So, you know, yeah, and parents, yep. yes, and parents yeah. get involved. So we need to start mandating some of these things, and then we'll probably have a better problem coming in and going into the <coughs> Uh, my question is, are there programs in the schools to help them learn to respect the people in the community? Uh, <coughs> starting at the beginning of the school year yeah. to the end, there's litter in my yard. I can hear <coughs> words that I would not expect to hear out of a sailor come out of a young girl's mouth, and they're screaming it at very early in the morning as they're coming home. I've seen fights. There have been times that I've seen near accidents because they just run out in the street, they're not paying attention. And I've also heard of times when other people in the community, because they're roughhousing around, have been injured, property has been damaged, we've had some thefts. What is being done to do to protect that? I agree, in the schools they're doing well. The kids in my neighborhood, who I know personally, have never caused the same problems. But as they're walking to schools, we're getting kids from other neighborhoods coming into ours and we don't know them. So to discipline them is difficult. We're wondering what programs are out there for the schools to just say, respect everybody in the neighborhood, not just the people you know. If uh, we had any elementary uh, principals here, uh, I'm sure that they could describe in some detail uh, the different parts of their curriculum that really deal with community and, and respect for property and, and one another and so forth. And those things are pretty widespread. Uh, pretty much the entire social studies curriculum from kindergarten through third grade uh, deals with those kinds of issues. Um, uh, for the three middle schools, that's something that we work on all the time, uh, both, both formally and informally, uh, particularly Eisenhower and Stewart, uh, because we are putting so many kids on the street walking to and from school every day. And, and we recognize that there are times that there are some issues on Markley Street, there are some issues on Marshall Street as our kids uh, travel back and forth. Um, after school programs are, are, are a big way that we deal with those kinds of things because instead of me putting uh, 700 kids out on the street every day at 3 o'clock, I'm putting uh, 4 or 5 because the rest are, are involved in the after school things. But, but it is important to us. We, we take the attitude uh, that living near us should be an asset, not a liability. <laughs> work with the kids uh, on that constantly. We also uh, work very cooperatively with Morristown Police Department. They, they really uh, uh, are, are excellent at working with us and trying to address uh, the general issue of our kids traveling back and forth and also specific concerns that uh, come to us from, from people in the community. So it's, it's something that's very important to us. Uh, we really do believe in that. Um, and and uh, curricular and, and other other strategies are useful. Yeah. So, I just wanted to know if from the students on the panel or anyone really, but I'm interested in the students really about how cell phones have become an issue this year or even last year. But what what do you think about the new um, craze where every student has to have a cell phone? And are there any policies specifically? I'll, I'm um, going to answer the policy. They're not allowed to have them in school. They're not allowed. <laughs> they're not allowed to have them in school. They can bring them in if, because we do have after school activities or they might want it on their way. They have to put it in their locker. It is not to be on their person or even in their pocketbook or their pocket during the school day. And at 3 o'clock or 2, 2.35 for us, they can take it out of their locker. At any other time, it is um, it's contraband. And it is a problem on several levels. It's a problem. First of all, they shouldn't be having conversations with anybody during the school day in the class to learn, and there is no free, no free time for that. And number two, we actually caught students cheating with the text messaging from class to class. So um, first class took a test, and they were text messaging the questions to friends in other classes. So <laughs> we at the high school are very firmly against self Oh, that was, but I just had to get that in. Yeah, that was so interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, at our school, I go to Renaissance. At our school, we're not allowed to have this. So there's, I don't know if this is true or not. Jeffrey Jackson, if it is. Is there like a state law in that school anyway? Pagers are not allowed in any school, uh, and that is in the public school code of Pennsylvania. A set, the cell phones are a new thing. I do have two students who are allowed to have them because they're paramedics and they are ambulance uh, travelers. Yeah, that. they're that's the only two of the, of the 1,800 kids that can have a cell phone. Yeah, that's the same at our school. We have like EMTs and stuff. Like they have there. But um, at our school, they have to stay in our locker room. Very rarely do all the students. Stay. I keep my eyes open all the time because, like, especially after September 11th, that's when we saw the increase. I'm not blaming for September 11th. People want to stay in contact with their family, I guess, just in case anything were to happen. And our school is located in the zone uh, for evacuation, just in case the Limerick power plant went out or something like that. So a lot of our students do carry them. But um, there are some students that do text messages and stuff like that, but they get taken away. But I feel that I should be able to have my cell phone with me. I mean, it's not one, well, I'm not calling anyone. But that's my personal opinion. I think, I think that, that rule needs to be told to um, a lot of teachers and a lot of adults who provide because like we, like we keep saying, this whole point we said that if children are reprimanded all the time, and they're not told to, that you have to uphold this rule, that you can't carry your cell phone with you. I mean, there's been plenty of times I walk down the hallway past the teachers with my cell phone and nobody, nobody said anything to me, which, do, which doesn't make it right at all. But if you don't keep, you know, Where do you go to school? I used to, I used to go to my high school. What school are you in now? Um, I go to school at home on the computer, so. Okay. Uh, Lisa, you're at the high school tomorrow in Wisconsin? Um, if we, if we have our cell phones in class, you know, the teacher does say something to you. I've seen it happen with other students in the classes. And, um, I mean, I feel we should have them for after school, for after, after school activities. But during school, they are pretty strict about, you know, keeping them away. They're not really supposed to send you to put anything away in your locker, but in the case they will tell you to put it away. They're pretty strict about that. Yeah. Don't you think you should have common sense to put them away? Or common sense? Everything's common sense. Teenagers, teenagers, teenagers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.